Well, I think let's go ahead and get started. Here you go, 10 o'clock whistle. So we're at Rose class, right Saturday, right day? All right, making sure. We had a few that thought Rose was yesterday and maybe some Barry today, so. So thanks for coming. I'm Trevor, our general manager here at Sunnyside. Rose class is always one of my favorites to teach, especially Valentine's week here. You can get your, get your sweetie a rose bush instead of a dozen roses you can throw in the compost in a week. So get a really grow your own sm smelly roses that way. <laughs> so who's been uh, who's been to classes here before? We got any newbies? We can welcome. Nice. We do have quite a few today. Thanks for coming. We've got some young gardeners in here too, which makes me happy. So we'll do roses. Um, you know, I'll start off by kind of saying something brutally honest. Um, I'm pretty brutally honest in some of the classes, and this is probably one that I'm extremely brutally honest in. <laughs> so uh, a lot of this is going to be up to you on what you want to do. I'm, my my job is to give you options uh, for caring for your roses, and you're going to have to make your own decision on if you want to go green, save the bees, do the right thing, do the easy thing. I'm, I'm not going to get into that just because I choose to to probably do the right thing and go organic doesn't necessarily mean you should. So I'm going to say that at the beginning. I'm not going to try to offend anybody and sit up here on the organic pulpit, but um, I think everybody knows what's going on in the world with the pollinator health and bees, neonic, pesticides, on and on and on. So you can kind of make your own choice with that stuff, but um, we'll certainly present you the, the, the couple of options that we have here at Sunnyside, okay? So we'll go through. Fast and Furious, we only got 49 slides here. We can do this in an hour, right? We'll beat yesterday, we were a little over an hour. So if we just kind of talk some, some general stuff about roses, um, and this is all types of roses that we'll be covering today. I want an extremely sunny location. If you know roses, uh, very, very few will tolerate a little bit of shade. And up here in our wet climate, Sun is a must. Um, if you're not going to fight mildew, black spot, and all the rest of it, we want the most sun we can have to keep those roses healthy, disease free, and blooming. So we want a really good sunny location. I don't care if it's all day, great. If it's you know all morning till one or two o'clock, that's okay too. Um, certainly the south or the west side is going to give us most of that heat in the afternoon. I found with some roses morning sun as long as we get it till not eight to you know sun up till 11 but till at least midday you will dry your foliage off a little bit earlier in the morning and that sometimes does help with disease prevention as well so don't think just because it's morning sun we can't do roses we can do it in, in either or um, one big thing with me is air circulation you know don't take a little bed and try to pack 20 roses into a little bed because you want 20 different ones we got to find some more places to have those in the landscape we want good space between them. I don't like little rows of straight lines staggering like a W. We'll hope that wind and the air kind of get through everything and dry things off. Um, look at, the, you know, can I tell you a space thing on every one? Yes, but I don't know which rows you have. So look at your tags. There's incredible information on there on height. You can always prune to keep them less bushy, but obviously I want tall to the back, shorter to the front, and then I can kind of gauge how much room. I'd say typically, I wouldn't even consider putting a rose closer than three feet to another one, and I think that's a little tight, to be honest. If you go a little farther, you'll have a nicer presentation with the plant, and again, better sun, uh, better air circulation. Um, you know, you can see on there, stagger plants, no rose. That drives me crazy. My neighbor does it all the time, and I'm like, you know, just stagger, and then you can put some things along the border. It'd look a lot nicer that way, and keep them a little bit healthier. Uh, one big thing with rose to me around our specific climate is drainage. We can't have hard pet clay, heavy clay. We've got to get that water through the soil. And rose is a pretty deeply rooted plant. This isn't something I need eight inches of good soil and I'm going to have a happy rose for all eternity. I need a couple of feet. So if I dig a hole and I'm down on hard pan, I really want to break that up, get some compost in there, improve the drainage. But especially in the wintertime, I want to make sure I've got adequate drainage moving through there and nothing getting too wet. Um, I always dig probably the biggest holes in my yard have been for roses that got transplanted. I really want to make sure I've got a big well that I can amend with all the things we'll talk about today, give that rose a great chance to get started and grow healthily long term. I'm not going to dig a little 12 by 12 hole the size of the pot, slip it in the ground. Um, it's going to be much better if we dig a really good sized hole in there. Um, and I, for me, this is with all plants, but you know what I mean when I kind of say a little moat or a drip line. You know, if I plant a new plant, 
I'm going to leave a little ridge of soil and a ring around there that I can go out there and really flood that plant the first season or two, especially with the rows again to get me a nice deep root system, apply the fertilizer in that area, everything we need for roses. That's a great way to go with a little moat of compost or bark or mulch that we can focus that water there, uh, especially in the summer months. Um, always amend your soil. You know, I've got two things I brought up in bags down here you can probably see in front. Planting compost organic from E.B. Stone and what we call now a hybrid soil. That rose mix is spectacular. So, you know, short, long story short is compost is always an amendment. I can't just dig a hole, fill it full of compost and expect any plant to thrive. I want to mix that one third, maybe two thirds with my native dirt, improve the soil structure and I'm going to have a great plant. The rose mix is a hybrid, a little bit different. I can grow that as potting soil. If I'm going to grow a rose in a pot, that's what I'm buying. If I want to just put a whole bag of that to give my rose a spectacular start, I can plant directly in that and not have any issues, if that makes sense. So it's almost a specific potting soil just for roses, some flowering plants, a little extra alfalfa meal, some extra things in there that will help that rose get, get going strong, okay? So when I plant a rose, and we'll say, who's, who's planning on taking home a rose today? Hopefully everybody right now. <laughs> um, if you're taking home roses, then you're going to plant new ones. You know, keep in mind those two soil options is one for our amendment. And then you see on the screen there a little list of some things that I would add in there right off the bat here to get started. So if I've got a young rose, new rose, I'm going half a cup of EB Stone rose food, and you'll see pictures of it up on the screen here in a minute. I'm going to go a quarter cup of alfalfa meal, which is a great specific rose amendment, a lot of little extra goodies in there to keep roses nice. And then I'm going to do maybe a couple tablespoons of Epsom salt. Does anyone use Epsom salt? Besides to soak your feet in the tub, right? A little different. But, uh, but this is a, a, a great amendment, not just for, honestly for roses, but anything I want, more bud, more bloom. Epsom salts is your key. Magnesium in there. And the sulfur, a little bit of a little bit on the pH adjustment, but the magnesium is one of those great things for chlorophyll and budding and blooming. So if I add that, I'm going to have a lot more flower power. And I don't know about you, but when I'm growing a rose, that's what I'm looking for. So we get a little more bud and bloom uh, doing doing the Epsom salts. I want to whirl water it in really thoroughly, like again when I plant it, apply my mulch, and then create that moat. That'll really help me out, especially that first summer as we go through. Okay. Do you add that sulfo mag? Sulfo mag we'll do it here in a second. Oh, yeah. okay. And I'll, I should always say at the beginning, we got lots of time after, we'll do questions at the end, because we got lots of time to, uh, I'm not going anywhere until five, so you can stay <laughs> all, as long as you like. Um, caring for roses long term, you know, there's no qualms about it. The rose is probably the heaviest feeder of any shrub in our garden. If I want a happy rose, maximum flower, fragrance, all that stuff, I need to continue to fertilize. This isn't something I fertilize once, walk away, and come back in July and say, oh wow, that's still spectacular. We gotta get on a regular fertilizing schedule. Not every week, not every month, but if we go organic, uh, which is what I would do, because it's a little longer lasting, we would wanna get on about a six week schedule. So we always kinda kick it off about this time of year on existing roses, to be honest with you here, late February, 1st of March, get on a six week schedule where I can go back and apply those same ingredients regularly through the season and I'll have a spectacular rose to enjoy all year. So if I've got established ones, if you've got ones in the ground already, a little bit less for the new ones we just talked about, we're going to go a little bit heavier with like a cup of organic rose food, about a half a cup of alfalfa, and then again a couple tablespoons, maybe four tablespoons on the Epsom salts if you want to keep that going too to, to maximize your flour. You know again, I use all, we pretty much carry all organic fertilizers here and that's the way I would go. Um, I don't have to worry about burning anything. Everyone knows that with organics. Much less water soluble, lasts in the soil a lot longer. Do I have a cup, measuring cup in my garage? Yes. Do I use it when I go out and measure a cup of food? No. So I'll be honest with you with that. So it's like, oh, it looks like about right. Two big handfuls. Sweet. Done. On to the next one. You can measure it out. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's the benefit of me being organic. I don't have to worry about it. A precise amount it's never going to damage the plant I've got a little extra food there for the next time so so easy to do um, the biggest thing with me to keep them blooming on this caring sheet and I obviously don't have any roses in bloom but does everybody know that next point there always deadhead spent flowers above sets of five leaves is that something everybody's kind of knowing and comfortable with be honest because that's a really tough one 
sometimes to notice. Any plant I have in a rose, I don't care if it's a single stem, a multiple flower, a climber, anything. If I want to maximize my flower and get an immediate bloom again, you have to cut above five leaves. If you don't, you know, maybe you only get two or three blooms a year on that stem. If I go to five leaves, I probably at least double that quantity. So always cut above five leaves to the outside bud, and then I'll keep my plant shapely and keep it blooming again um, as quick as possible, okay? Um, always avoid overhead watering. I'm gonna say that like four times. Always avoid overhead watering. Um, that's a pretty good rule, honestly, in the garden, but especially with roses. If I'm gonna go out and bless my rose garden, <laughs> every evening don't water up here go to the base if i'm a disease which is what i worry about more around our climate i need wet foliage to blow in from the neighbor's yard who doesn't take care of our roses right then i get on yours and i get black spot if i have dry foliage that's not going to be as easy for that disease to propagate itself so don't water overhead if you have a sprinkler system great do it early in the morning so once that sun comes up we dry it off and off we go for the day okay don't don't go out and do no sprinklers at 5 p.m. That's the worst time of the day to do it. Um, the big thing right now, um, you know, I like the timing, A, because Valentine's Day is all about roses to me, but B, we're, we're approaching President's Weekend, and that's always kind of one of the D-Days for me uh, for rose care. Veterans Weekend in the fall, President's Weekend in the spring. If you have existing roses, I don't want any leaves left on that plant, period, when you're done with it here at President's Day. It's going to be tough because you're probably like mine. Wow, I got some leaves still on that thing and a little bit of new growth. We don't want any of that stuff on there going into the next season. You can't see it, but I can almost guarantee you, if you got mildew, you got black spot, you got all the above, it's going to start on there right off the bat if we leave that winter foliage on there. So when we prune these back, we strip the leaves, we get the food on, boom, off we go for, for 2023, okay? So this time of year, I'm always like kind of hip high in the fall, knee high come springtime. That's not climbing roses. I'm not telling you to cut your climbing roses. It's taken 10 years to get to the top of the arbor, down to nothing. This is just shrub roses. We want to get to a comfortable height for you. Maybe it's not knee, I like them a little taller. It's up to you, but we want to get them cut back to some sort of starting height, good structure, strip the foliage, Remove dead wood. You can pretty easily see on a rose black wood, brown wood, pieces that need to come out entirely. Um, and if we've, any, for me, my rule is always pencil thickness with a lot of plants. If I look out and see a bunch of woody mess in my shrub rose, I'm going to try to thin out all the stuff in the center, particularly, and anything that's le less thick than a pencil. So I don't have any of those weak growth. I want the nice, sturdy cane. With the rose, it's almost your hand. You know, I got the hand sitting out here. Here's my graft or the center. I want all those canes coming out from the center and then up. I don't want anything cluttering my center, again, for sun and for air going through. So as you get here towards President's Weekend, I think is this week, or actually, what is it, next Monday, the week from Monday. So, you know, sometime here in the next week or two, try to get these cleaned up uh, going into the spring because it's really going to get you a good good the, the right start here for the next year yes where do you cut do you have to cut a certain spot on the cane well and you can see you know I, I again obviously we have old ones here but if i look at this is a hybrid tea called sugar moon and we get the we get all our roses bare root we hand prune everything you don't have to prune anything that we've already done it's been done for you but that's a great example of a simple rose i've got an open center my canes are kind of going out like i talked about if I look at each one of these canes, I should check, my staff did a good job, yes they did. Every one of these stems, you know, rose is one of those plants that's got opposite buds, right? Both sides of the stem as it goes down. I want outside, always. I don't want anything growing back again into the middle to grow. So I don't really care how far we go down, I'm looking for a bud on the outside of those canes that I'm leaving that I can prune above at a nice angle. Here comes my shoot, and then off we go with that nice open shape. Yes. <clears throat> Could clean all if you, if you especially with rose, just because again, I'm not trying to to pick on mildew and black spot, but I think everybody's like, oh yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. You know, we don't want any of that stuff left. I mean, whether you do it in the fall, I I try to clean mine up in the fall. Um, certainly do it now if you haven't, because we want again start the next season clean and give us the best chance to to keep it going. Okay. So does that help a little bit on pruning? It's always kind of looking, you'll see 
you know you can see some stuff already breaking but that's easy and yours are probably at that point too i know mine in the yard are about like this right now ready to go but even when they're dormant dormant i can still see those little swollen bright nodes where i can cut above and then off we go for the season okay now one thing i put at the end there a transplant because somebody's going to end up asking me can i move a rose i want to get another one i want to give it to my neighbor whatever if we're transplanting anything including roses we got about two three more weeks here and I would sh try to shy you away from doing it in the growing season. So you're going to have a near 100% success if we can dig that up here when it's still dormant, get it relocated, get the food in, all the rest of the stuff we've talked about, <coughs> and then off we go in a new home for, for 2023, okay? Now, the, the big thing, again, diseases and insects. You know, I, you know, everything in the world probably gets an aphid on, and I think everybody knows what an aphid is. We get little stipled leaves and on and on white flies maybe there's other bugs that perhaps get on i think for our climate i'm more worried about the disease end of it the fungus again black spot mildew rust different issues that will blow around in the cool wet springs um, we always have those i hate to remind you once we get to summer it's great rose weather nice and dry and warm for a long time here we need to get to that point when the season changes with the clean rose and we're going to be pretty good to go during the during the summertime so the spring here, we gotta watch early. If you, again, if you bring me a sample of your rose, Mr. Lincoln has black spot this year, and you come in here in June and you're enjoying the flowers and you're like, yeah, my leaves look terrible. Look at all the spots on here. There's not gonna be a lot of choices to get rid of that for the season. I mean, it's not gonna kill the plant. It makes it look terrible, um, but we can try to keep it from spreading, but I'm not gonna have a thing that snap my fingers and say, oh, look, all your black spots gone for the year. We get on it early, and try to stay ahead of the game then we're not going to have it in the first place and i'm hoping that's kind of the choices a lot of you will make today is hey if i do this early and keep up on it during the wet spring then i don't have to deal with it down the road okay um consider the choice to protect the bees and pollinators again i'm not going to stand here on the pulpit and preach but that's going to be up to you um you can look up all the products online and they'll tell you exactly what's in them and what what to be careful of um you know the the options are going to be this and i'll show you the bottles here we'll see them in the show but um you know one choice is use a systemic drench you know when i use the word systemic everybody kind of knows what that is i pour it into the soil which is better than spraying it for you but i pour it into the soil that plant absorbs the systemic through the root system and it's literally shields up from the inside out if that makes sense so if i'm a bug disease and i try to get started on that plant the systemic will certainly do the best job at protecting you from square one. But again, being systemic means I go through everything, wood, twig, cane, thorn, flower. And when Mr. B comes down, he's going to end up getting some of that systemic. So that's the one thing to keep in mind. Sometimes people feel okay doing it early and then walking away from it when the bees are active. You know, look at your products. I'll let you decide. Um, how long they last in plants and, and how you know how much damage we're going to do to the bee population so that that's option one option two is use a spray like rose shield here so if i'm a grower typically that's the direction i'm going to go i can get on a spray schedule this would be probably like the drench would be something you do like every six weeks the rose shield would be like once a month and if I have that on there, I can tell you, you're not going to have anything. You know, if I, if I keep up on it and don't leave a gap and stay up on that, you're going to have very clean roses using Rose Shield. Again, chemical systemic, so a little bit different, but a spray form. The other option is we go natural, green, organic, whatever term you want to call it. And now we're into the neem oils. Anyone tried neem oil and use neem oil? I use it for a lot of stuff in my own yard. It's very effective, not just roses, but a lot of things. But I have to keep up on it. This is where you gotta be honest with yourself as a rose gardener. I'd love to grow some roses. Awesome, so do I. Do you, how clean do you want them? And are you going to take care of them and spray? And that's gonna dictate kind of how happy those roses are. Feeding is huge. A well-fed plant's always gonna be more resilient. Not watering overhead's gonna help you. I mean, there's a lot of things we can help do a cultural we can pick the most disease resistant rose in the entire world it doesn't mean immune I want to make sure that's clear because everybody sees the word disease resistant oh, I'll buy that one because I'll never have to spray it in our climate that's not the answer I hate to hate to tell you to be honest we, we got to watch watch nearly all of them okay 
So I'll let you guys take your pick. The biggest thing is to me, time versus money versus, you know, again, pollinator health. So, you know, if you've got a little time, keeping up on neem oil is something we would do probably every couple weeks, you know, honestly, in the wet weather. And it doesn't take long. We were talking before class about rubbing it on leaves. I don't know that you have to go that crazy. But if we get a good sprayer, and we make sure we coat it under and top. I mean, neem oil is very effective for a lot of these problems. The, the one thing to keep in mind is, you know, I don't care if I use the, the chemical, the neem, any product period, if I spray it on a bee, it's not gonna turn out well. I mean, neem oil is just as poisonous to a bee as a systemic is. Don't get it on the bee. If I spray, get up early in the morning, no bees are out there, sweet. Get my plant sprayed, dries it on, I'm good to go. I'm not gonna walk out at one o'clock and say, ooh, there's bees all over. Let me get my neem oil out and get my spraying done. You're gonna do just as much damage to the bee doing that, okay? So keep those things in mind. You know, again, I, if you got the time, um, neem oil is a great way to go, and it's a useful thing on a lot of things. We use it on all of our house plants here. We use it on a lot of things at the nursery, um, and it just takes a little bit more time as a gardener because you're doing a little more often, but um, you'll have just as much luck if you keep up on it, okay? So if you kind of look at some of these, if you can't see the, the little product show here in front, um, you know, everything we have now is going to a pouch. So this is now alfalfa meal. That box on there will be deleted next year because I still have a little bit. But everything's to a pouch because I can tear this, Velcro it, reseal it, use it. I'm not going to take four pounds of alfalfa meal and ever dump it on a rose. So I, need, I, I want something in my garage I can seal, stick in my van, bring back out when I need it. So you'll see red dots. I think there's only like six left before class today. But all this is half price. There's nothing wrong with any of this. But these good good rose products in the boxes with the red dots you can have for half price the last little bit because now we'll have pouches pouches for all that so alfalfa meal you'll see that in the store the rose and flower food yes it does have a little bit of alfalfa in it that's one of the base ingredients it's all organic but i would still supplement with more alfalfa meal that's one of those great products for roses we typically go through and add it takes a lot of time for us and it costs a lot but we'll, we'll typically at some point here in the next month or so dump a quarter cup of alfalfa meal on every single one of those 2,000 potted roses out there. It takes a little bit of time. But again, it just helps with color, fragrance, the growth, all the above. There's your Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. And then Sulpomag, a few people were asking. This is kind of a specialty amendment. You know, everyone know kind of fertilizers? We got three numbers, right? We got nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Nitrogen's kind of leaves, okay? Phosphorus is more bud bloom. The third number is your, is your potassium content, and that tends to be all, we call it all around. It's almost like up, down, and all around for the three numbers. And that potassium's really gonna help your rows when we talk about the graft, we talk about budding, we talk about new canes, the root system, all the things that have nothing to do with bloom. That might be something I, I put on mine at least once a year. Typically it's early in the season or in the fall. Maybe if I do a second dose, it's not something I gotta go back and do every six weeks like the rest. But that might be something to consider, consider especially if you have existing roses that might be struggling a little bit. That might be an amendment that might help you get a little, get a little extra kick here for 2023. <coughs> You'll see the bag of the rose mix there. Um, you know, rose to me, um, blooms as much as any annual. I don't know how yours do, but I have a lot of times to look at my patio and go, you know what, I'm just going to get another rose and plant in a pot because I can enjoy that all summer, have fragrance, have the color I want, and not plant as much geranium, petunia, and the rest of it. So that could be used as a great potting soil um, for specifically for roses. So if you're going to do them in pots or in the ground, either one of those will make a great amendment, but certainly the, the rose planting mix will make you a great little uh, potting soil as well. There's pictures of your bottles. So there's your, the murder, death, kill, rose drench. <laughs> you got the murder, death, kill, rose shield. And honestly, neem oil is pretty good murder, death, kill too. But that would be your, your again, natural, much safer option if you want to go that route. The, the one thing I'll say before we move on is the, the neem oil is a little bit confusing. And Bonite intentionally packages their stuff. I can see brown, right? Brown cap, brown label, brown shoulder. If I look at chemicals, I don't have that color. So, I mean, you can scan our little pharmacy and pick out all the natural stuff just by looking for that brown label. Neem oil is packaged in a lot of different ways. This is specifically 
for rose gardeners. It's called Rose RX. That would speak to all of us like, ooh, that's what I need for my rose. This is no different than going in there and buying neem oil or neem max or any of the other forms of neem we had. Um, it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. So as long as you get neem oil in some form, we can use it exactly like we can with that Rose RX, okay? Now selecting roses for you as a gardener, if we're going to be honest, right, we're going to say, all right, I'm going to, I'm signing up, I'm signing up for spray, I'm signing up to do this. Um, you know, you be honest with yourself because that's going to be picking out the, the right roses for you as a gardener. I'll say this before I start preaching again about different roses, but you know, for me, I love roses. You know, I had a rose garden. I'm an old dad. I'm in my getting towards mid 50s here. I got two young sons. My, my boys are only 11 and 8. When they were born, it's like, you know what? I don't have time to mess with this old hybrid tea rose garden. So those went away, and I got shrub roses because I like the color. They're easier to care. I don't spray. So that's what I did when the kids are out of the house here and my sentence is over, right? <laughs> I'll have my rose garden back when I got time because I like, I like cutting my roses. So you can do it both ways. But you know, when, we, when it comes down to it, if you think about it, and all the choices you have as a gardener, what is the one shrub that blooms continuously from May all the way until we get frost in the fall? What's the one plant that does that? Rose. And there is no other choice if you want the longest season of flower and fragrance a lot of time. You can pick a zillion choices. It's just a great shrub to grow, okay? So every year, um, we get new roses in. I mean, I spend a lot of time researching myself. Um, this stuff we ordered like last summer, just showed up here in January. Um, I'm a test grower here for both of the major rose guys, Weeks and Star Roses are the only two left. Jackson Perkins doesn't exist. The internet will tell you that it does, but it does not exist. They sell their roses from those two. Uh, place was gone many moons ago. So there's some good online rose distributors or growers the two big wholesalers are those two companies and we ship in I don't even know the name I'll get a rose in like what's that gonna turn into it's got a funky number on it 92-873 and they want to tell me what it is so I plant it out back in a pot we water it we feed it I don't spray it because I want to see what happens if you told me you're taking it home to spray it and you were really lying to me and said you're not going to What's it gonna look like by summer? Ooh, that's terrible. Okay, that's not a good disease resistant one. So the point is, we spent some time here looking at new. I don't get all the new ones in every year just because they're new. It's like, that is garbage, you're out of here. I would never sell that to somebody. I like that one instead. So we trial them last season for what just came in, if that makes sense. So a lot of the new stuff every year, if you see it on our list, it was worthy to grow in our specific Western Washington climate, okay? So there's one, um, we tell, like I said, test it every year. One big thing, I won't rip one of these out because then the staff will get mad and they'll have to replant it. But um, one big thing to look at, does everyone know when I say like budded or grafted roses versus own root? Does everyone kind of know that a little bit? Well, it, it basically to me is hardiness. If, if I graft, let's pick a rose. Let's go old Double Delight, right? Been around here for 70 years and everybody still wants to grow old Double Delight, right? So that is a plant that will not grow its own root system. It has to be budded or grafted onto a garbage rootstock. Not garbage, that's what you mean. But it's not the rose you want. It's a rose, but it's like, ooh, what happened to that? So that's how we have Double Delight, Mr. Lincoln, a lot of classic roses. Other roses will develop their own root and we have no graft. That's hardiness is the, in a nutshell. If I live in a colder climate, up in the foothills, I'm a little chilly, whatever the case is, if I have an own root rose, I'm going to be superior in root hardiness. That gives me probably 30 degrees more hardy than a grafted rose. In western Washington, we hardly ever lose grafted roses, maybe once a decade. A couple years ago, it happened to a lot of us, uh, grafted roses. But if it's own root, I don't have to worry about it because it's not the rose that is not hardy. It's that graft union, the part above the ground. And I can mulch it, I can do some things to help protect it, but that's the weak point of this plant. Does that make sense to everybody? So when you're looking, I try our list and out there, everything I have says OR in parentheses after it, if I have own root. And every possible rose that is available own root, I purchase for us because I would rather have own root than bud. It's an easy choice, but there's some you're not going to get Double Delight. You're not going to get Mr. Lincoln. You're not going to get some, I mean, I could list, a, you know, 50 that we carry that we would never find on root. They just don't grow a root system. 
So keep that in mind who's making your choice. In town, doesn't matter. I'm up there, Skycomish, certainly Eastern Washington, other areas. I'm gonna have to be a lot more careful on what root system I have on there, okay? The other part of that to me is the root stock. A lot of people will come in here in July or June and say, man, my rose started growing, it looked great. Then the flowers came out and I'm like, well, that's not what I had. What the heck is that thing? It's just a garbage, like double pink, no fragrant or red flower. You probably, I hate to say, lost your rose and that's coming off the root system, if that makes sense. So that would be the root system rose that we would just take the plant, throw it in the compost heap in the sky and go get a different rose to plant in there because it will not ever go back to the way it was, okay? <clears throat> so this is the first year for me. See, I've been running Sunnyside for 12. I ran Whites and Linwood for 19 before. I'm trying to think, it's probably been 15 years since I've had a rose tree that I've made for sale here. I'm not a huge rose tree fan, I'm going to be brutally honest, but a lot of people asked for them and I thought, you know what, I'm going to succumb to the masses this year. We got, <laughs> we got a few. They're in the greenhouse, which should tell you something. The problem to me with the rose tree, um, it's a great idea for a patio. I like the idea of a rose tree in a pot because I can do something with it in the winter. But the problem with the rose tree is now I have two grafts. I have a graft right here and I have a graft above the ground and there's no other way to get a rose tree. So what's gonna happen if we get any amount of chilly weather in the winter? That rose tree is done. So yes, my mother grabs pantyhose and makes her little insulation <laughs> ball around the graft and we can stuff stuff in there. There's ways you can help protect it, but I'm just being honest again, brutally honest. If you're not gonna mess with that going into winter, don't get a rose tree. If you're gonna keep it in a pot or the landscape and you're gonna take a little time every October and say, okay, I'm gonna get you protected for the winter, you're probably gonna be okay, okay? So my tip would be this, go get pipe insulation, big old foam pipe with a slit, right? You can go wrap your hot water, the same thing, and literally put a piece of pipe insulation from the ground all the way up to the top graft, and then stuff something amongst the whole top there to give it a little bit of protection, you're probably okay. If I plant that, if I had that out this year, I would have expected, I got to seven at my house in Everett in December, twice, and I would expect my tree rose would not be looking so swell or come springtime if that was the case, okay? So it's something kind of not new in the garden. Rose trees have been around forever, but certainly new for Sunnyside. We talk, talked about it with our staff and we thought, you know what, I'm never gonna get a hundred of them, but I think I got 40 of them and we've got every color, some good ones in there to try, but just keep that in mind if you want to do a rose. Now, I'll say this before we stop roses. If you're gonna buy one of those, I'd rather not have you take it home because the problem with these is, what is that already done? Looks great, you know, it's got blooms on it. It's gonna start, you know, the foliage is out. It'll start blooming a little earlier. Please don't take it home until after we're done with frost. If I take that home and we get another cold snap, you're gonna come back and complain to me and want your money back, which makes neither of us happy, how's that? So, so try, Try to, I don't care, if you want to claim one, great, we'll put your name on it, I don't even care, you can pay for it if you want, it's yours, you know, we'll keep care of it here for you, and call you probably in a month, you know, later March or so, you know, we'll watch what the weather does, sweet, take it home, get it in the ground, and off you go, you know, it's, it's just easy as that, but I would not haul one home today, unless you have a greenhouse to keep it in, we don't keep that super warm, but it certainly is not going to freeze in there, okay? Uh, patio roses, another one kind of new for us. Who, who's done miniature roses in the past? Anybody? That's another one that, you know, years and years ago, I used to do a bunch of them. I just haven't for a long time. And again, a lot of people asking for a small container patio rose that could grow, enjoy absolute spectacular color in a small size. You know, they don't, I don't want this. I want a little tiny thing that I can enjoy some flowers with in the sun, whether it's in the ground or in a pot. So we do have some nice patio roses back there for the first time too. We, we call them patio now instead of miniature rose, but you can grow them in the ground. You can certainly grow them in containers. Those are all own root as well. So I was a little happier doing them now. I don't worry about winter death as much because again, they're not, the ones that we have are not grafted, okay? So choose your rose wisely. There's the last bit there. And I'll just leave it at that because you're probably gonna guess what I'm gonna say next. Be honest with yourself as a gardener Pick out what you've got time for and you'll be happy with your rose. So if we look at different types 
I'm going to whip through a bunch of pictures here and show you some really good ones. But if we look at some basic types, does everyone kind of know what a hyper T rose is? That's your florist rose. If I've got long stem, single flower at the top, that's my hyper T. They're everything back there is labeled. They'll tell you everything you need. Grandiflora is my exhibition rose. Maybe a little bit taller, still super long stem, great for cutting. But now I typically have three blossoms at the top and the bloom in progression, okay? Floribunda is my personal favorite. I'm not cutting them as much, bringing them inside. That's landscape color to me. Superior fragrance, big bouquets of flowers, a lot of bloom. That's something maybe a little bit bushier most of the time and a little bit lower growing in the three, four foot range. That's going to give me maximum color, but I'm not going to go out and cut a stem and bring it in the vase. If I want to cut roses, it's those first two, okay? Climbing roses. I'm going up on a structure in sun, not shade, but in sun, an arbor, a trellis. It's not a vine that's going to connect itself and hold itself. I have to attach it to something. Does that make sense? So I'm tying it lightly onto a post, a trellis, whatever, and letting it grow gradually to do exactly what I wanted. Have nice flower in sun and good smell. Uh, ground covers, which is a lot what I have in shrub roses right now because those are going to offer maximum color and typically don't have to be deadheaded, don't have to be cut back, except the one time in spring to get it ready for the next year, okay? So look at some of the ground cover. We do happy trails. I brought one of them up here. We can see it after class. Flower carpets, drift roses. We'll have a lot of flower carpet drift here in about a month. We don't do those bare root, but I do have happy trails in. Those are all very disease resistant, very easy to grow. Probably not the smelliest roses, to be brutally honest. Most of those will have slight fragrance at most, but I'm looking for color. I want to look out and sun in my shrub border and see flowers all summer and fall. Those are all good choices for that, okay? David Austin roses. If you like a little frankincense with some myrrh, you know, or apple with the hint of pear, you know, something, something the Brits will send us. Uh, the worst smelling Austin rose is going to smell better than any other rose on the property. How is that? If I'm going, if I'm going for fragrance, I'm going for David Austin. Uh, we got a lot in this year. There was kind of a gap on those the last couple years, but we got a really good selection. We also started a rambling or climbing. David Austin, like David Austin area. So I can do a shrub David Austin or pick out an appropriate one that would be excellent to ramble or climb on a structure as well, okay? Uh, shrub roses are the hardy ones. Those are gonna be our own root. That's a lot what I have right now um, in my yard, own root, easy to grow, something I don't have to mess with as much. Um, some smell great, some don't smell at all. You know, that's going to tell you on the specific variety. I went for ones that obviously got a nice little smell too. Um, but there's some great shrub roses that really don't require spraying or any deadheading again if we do this the right way. Um, that's an easy one. Uh, tree roses we looked at and then again we've got the, the patios back there as well here for, for 2023. So again, be honest with yourself. Those are the questions you should be mulling from the left brain to the right brain right now, right? Will I spray? Will I deadhead? Do I want to have cut flowers inside or am I going for smell? Am I, do I just want summer color, which is essentially what I wanted? There's again, no better blooming shrub for sawn than the rose. You know, rose and hydrangea are the two things that bloom the longest season by far. So the rose is your best option for sun, okay? <coughs> Now, if we look at some purties here, I'm gonna whip through a few. This doesn't mean these are the only good ones out there. We've got probably, I should count one of these years. I think there's 180 different roses back there this year. Um, and we get fives and tens. You can probably go back there and go, why does he have 40 of those? Because we all like it and it's a good one to grow here. So you can probably do that if you wanna do it that way too. Uh, but some of these are great. You just kind of show you a few options. Uh, Perfume Factory. Uh, came out last year. You can probably guess what that one is. Extremely fragrant. That's a good one. Um, All My Love is another great fragrant one of the pinks. Uh, Pretty Lady. That's from anybody who watched Downton Abbey or did watch Downton Abbey. Yeah, there's a whole Downton Abbey series of roses. Pretty Lady is one of those uh, that was introduced kind of through the BBC as well. That's a great rose and a, a pretty unique color too. Uh, there's, I don't know how many roses do we have with love in them, probably a dozen back there. So you can get love at first sight is one. 
uh, painted porcelain I thought was really pretty. A lot of the rose growers, to be honest, when we get disease resistance, maybe we sacrifice a little bit of fragrance sometimes. Um, it's kind of been the way I've seen it go here the last decade or so. But a lot of the growers, I think, are getting really cool bicolors. Like if you looked at it from the front, you'd be like, oh, that's a nice soft pink. And then you're like, wait a minute. I see like ivory and cream and some different colors in there too. Uh, there's some really pretty roses that to me, 20 years ago, I would have thought, yeah, that was growing in South America at the floor shop. You can't grow that here. And now a lot of these you can um, do, do very well. Uh, I think Veterans Honor is at the top of my list for a red. It's not super fragrant. It's still got good smell, um, but that probably for a red is the, one of the better disease resistant reds. Uh, good old Hank Henry Fonda is the best yellow hybrid tea. We get a good slew of those. And I brought Sugar Moon up here. For some reason, who likes white these days? Everybody likes white flowers again, which I think is pretty cool. We, we're, we're like, wow, everybody bought white last year. Um, Sugar Moon is absolutely at the top of my rose list if you like white. I mean, that has got incredible fragrance and really clean plant. Um, I still would spray a little bit, but that's one I think you've got a much better chance of maybe forgetting once in a while to take care of it and it's still gonna look pretty good. So Sugar Moon's right there in white. Uh, Francis Meelan, the Meelan family out of Star Roses, we get Papa Meelan, Francis Meelan, we get a few of theirs. Those are always gonna be towards the top of the fragrance list as well. Big, huge flowers um, and heavy fragrance. Um, yellow's my color, so I had to put good as gold in there. I like that one as well. That one's a little different yellow. You know, we got your lemon and buttery yellows. That one's almost like an orangey gold. It really is almost a golden yellow. A little bit different color on good as gold. Just Joey, been around for years. That's another one. If you're going for apricot you know, kind of color tones, that's the best one to do. We don't do brandy. We don't do a lot of other old ones that I used to because again, too much black spot. This one's been the cleanest um, and that kind of color scream uh, for us. Uh, Pinkerbell, that's always a fun one to say. Who likes Pinkerbell? <laughs> uh, that's kind of a nice two-tone one as well. Um, now we look at some Grandifloras. Again, a little bit taller perhaps. A lot of those will say tall on the tag. Maybe I'm up there in the six foot range if I don't prune it hard. I'm a pretty good sized rose. Um, I would put Twilight Zone at the top of any rose list. I think that's been one of our best ones around. I have never seen anything that purple, and it is deep, dark purple, and it smells incredible. That's got old rose fragrance to it. Uh, that one we scored and got about 50 of them, so how many people are in here today? We'll get them sell them all. So Twilight Zone for purple, and I don't have any other rose that's close to that color, any other classification. Purple's a really hard color to, to come by up here. Uh, pop art, as I smile, I'm not quite sure what to say about pop art. If you can see that thing, that is really funky. If you like funky roses, there's your pop art for you. That's got great form and pretty good smell, but that's got all kinds of weird swirls of color going on that one. That one came out last year. Uh, we do have some of those again. Uh, Parade Day, one of those variegated roses where you can kind of see, again, pink as a base color but a lot of the creams and whites, kind of variegated flowers, are really nice uh, for a big tall ground of flora. And I always call that the Sandra Bullock Rose, Miss Congeniality. Um, that's a different color. That was one of the first ones to me that came out, kind of looks like that Picketty flower you see at the floor shop again. I've got one color rose. It's almost like somebody took a little paintbrush, you know, and kind of painted all the petals on that rose to give it a little pop. That's a great example of one of those, Miss Congeniality. All Queen, rest in peace. I got some extra Queen Elizabeth this year because I know I've had one in my yard and I'll do another one again. That's a great old classic uh, fragrant light pink uh, Grand Flor. And if you, you miss the Queen, we got some extras. You can add the Queen Elizabeth back into the, back into the garden there as well. Uh, Anna's Promise is another one of those BBC Downton Abbey roses we've had for a few years now. Um, it's a very different color. If you look at that, it's almost like a brassy you know, kind of brassy, not orange, not apricot. It's kind of all those colors mixed together. Um, and that's another great one we've had, we've had really good luck with and it's promised. State of Grace. Now, and Happy Go Lucky, really both of those. Um, great ground of floras, but this is kind of what I've seen. Um, Weeks and Star Roses are the two big bare root growers going towards. They're trying to go to battle with Mr. David Austin. So if you look at these flowers, 
a lot of these new Granite Floors, especially the last couple years, um, really getting that kind of old rose, that quartered, ruffled center, the heavy fragrance again, um, where they're trying to, I think, kind of have their own English rose collection, which is probably a smart move, to be honest. But State of Grace probably looks like two or three David Austins we've had over the years, too. That, that's, that's a really cool color again, a little bit different. Happy Go Lucky would be our, our good yellow Grande Flora. Now, here's some good Flora Bundas. Um, these again, a little bit bushier, typically I'd say probably four foot-ish, you know, on a, on a good summer. Bouquets of flowers, I'm not cutting them and bring them into vase. I want to look out, have color, I'm out weeding around, I want to have some fragrance. or some great, super fragrant uh, floor bundas as well. Um, I think some pretty cool colors have come out. Most of these have been in the last few years um, that really pop. Like, you can't get a lot of bluey lavender um, the Arctic Blue is really cool. That was was out about two years ago. I love my orange, Burst of Joy is another really good one. Celestial Night almost gets us like a plum color. And again, that David Austin kind of quartered, ruffled flower look. Mm -hmm. um, I'll smile as I say ketchup and mustard because that is not one of, my, one of my favorites. But it's probably the first one that sells out here every year. So everybody else likes ketchup and mustard. I don't like condiments, so that's probably why I don't do that. <laughs> ketchup and mustard but that that's again red with yellow looks like ketchup and mustard that's a pretty easy one uh, easy spirit if you're going white that's a great example of weeks roses has a whole group they call easy to love roses and we carry most all of them here um, again mostly floribundas um, in, in, in parentage but probably towards the top of the disease resistant list not immune but again, towards the top of resistance, some of these you could almost walk away from here. They're pretty easy to grow on some of those easy to love. So Easy Spirits, the white one. Julia Childs is the yellow one. If I was to pick one rose, if you were a, maybe a beginning gardener, wanted to play around with the rose, have good fragrance, have an easy plant, that would be the top of my list for anybody. I think Julia is about the easiest rose to grow around here. If you like some yellow, a little tiny bit of pink, but heavy fragrance, and superior disease resistance. That's probably the easiest one uh, that we carry back there. Uh, Life of the Party is a newer one again. If you like the old Peace Rose, you know, to me this kind of brings the Peace Rose into the Floribunda uh, type where I'm going to have the yellows, the pinks, the kind of mixture of colors. Um, that's been a really good performer here the last couple years. Uh, Love Song is the best lavender. If you're looking for lavender, we don't do sterling silver, that's garbage around here. Lagerfeld, I can go on and on. There's a bunch of lavender, bluey roses that are just brutal in our weather. That's the one to me that we've stuck with all these years because I think it is the best one of all. Um, if you can do Floribunda and you like lavender, uh, that offers everything for you. Uh, Frida Kahlo, you can see nice little artist painting there. That's a fun flower. Um, that's another popular one for our customers. You got Rosie the Riveter, we got a flex, right? Rosie the Riveter uh, came out probably four or five years ago and that I'm putting up there pretty close to Julia Child. I think that one is a really easy rose to grow. Um, if you like the kind of orangey tangerine color tones, that's a really good, really easy rose to grow as well. Uh, Sun Sprite is an old fashioned favorite and I still get a zillion Sun Sprite. Uh, maybe that's one got sentimental value to me. Um, it's always grafted, that one's not own root, but that's an old classic. It's the first rose to bloom every year. I mean, I've been doing roses like 32 years now, every year without exception. That is the first one to flower, and it is super fragrant. And if you like yellow, it's a good choice. I need to spray that. I want to be clear, that's not towards the top of the resistant list. But if you like early color, yellow, and sweet fragrance, uh, Sun Sprite's unbeatable for a, for a yellow floor bunda. Then of course we got a little pumpkin patch. You can probably guess what color that one is. Uh, some climbers. Um, you know, last year we sold out of climbers pretty early. We got extra in this year. Everybody was into white roses and climbing roses the last couple years, it seems like. Um, so we do have a really good batch of climbers. Uh, we did get shorted on some. I don't know that they'll last long. So if you're looking for a climber, I'd uh, probably grab it here pretty quick in spring because this is not something I can reorder or, or get again. Uh, Fourth of July is exactly that, little fireworks of red, white, and a little bit of yellow in there. Joseph's Coat's a great one if you like kind of more of the, the orangey yellow to 
to pinky color tones. Uh, we carry a lot of different Edens. We have white Eden, we have plain Eden, we have pretty and pink Eden, we have we have a bunch of different Edens. Um, I think that, if I remember right, I did. I was like, wow, that surprises me. That is the number one planted rose in the entire world, which just kind of, it's like, really? That one of all of them? Everybody loves Eden, not just here, but across the entire U.S. That's a pretty versatile rose uh, to grow. Uh, Don Juan, the player, if you want red, you want super fragrant, that's at the top of the list for a climber as well. We can do purple, with some purple splash, that's a really good one, got a little bit of white variegated in there. And then Golden Opportunity is a newer one, we have other yellows back there that are good, but Golden Opportunity again was kind of like that good as gold, a little bit different color, more towards that orangey side of yellow that I think really was a, really a little different for the, for the yard. A couple patios. Um, you know, just an example, again, the patio roses aren't going to be super fragrant, the, some of them have slight, but I'm looking for a color for a little container, you know, on a sunny porch or the garden in a little small spot. I want flower power, don't care as much about, about uh, fragrance, um, but I'll have good flowers all the way through frost. So we have, I think, six different ones back there. I tried to get a red, a pink, a yellow, some different colors to choose from, but we do have some nice options. I put a couple on there, life's little pleasures, and I thought all of Twitter kind of made me smile. I was like, oh, there you go, marketing to the next generation, right? <laughs> now, shrub roses. Now, again, I was honest before, so this is kind of where I'm at right now in life, is I have a little shrub rose garden and some th ones around the landscape. I'll go back to my hybrid teas here someday, but, but uh, this is where we probably cut our maintenance down I won't, I won't say to zero, but we're getting pretty close. Um, my shrub roses, I touched, I, I had a rule of my rose after the kids were born. If I have to touch you more than twice a year, you're out of here. I'm gonna move on to something else. So I don't even know that I touched mine twice last year. I think it was once. And so if you walk by my, you drove by my place in Everett, you know, maybe as an example, I got one in my bank called Fragrant Spreader. Probably only gets two feet tall, probably gets six or seven feet across by late summer. Nice little light pink flowers, nothing crazy, smells good, we got a nice little fragrance, but I don't have to touch it. I've never had any black spot mildew. Yes, aphids, who cares? You can have a little leaf, I'm not worried about it. But all that, that's it. I mean, all I do is walk out once in the winter, I just did it, and took my mass of green twigs that's huge, down to a little nub, and off you go again. We'll see you again next winter kind of thing. Yes, I throw some food on it to start the year, but pruning, deadheading, all the rest of it, done. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff when we're talking shrub roses. If you know Ragosa Rose, right, just a second, we'll do, we'll do questions. It's funny to repeat the name. Uh, the one I have is called Fragrant Spreader, and I shouldn't say that because I've been looking for them for 10 years, but <laughs> I'll hopefully find them again. It was one that uh, Proven Winners put out years ago. I've had somebody come to my house and take pieces because I don't know that it exists anymore in the trade and I'm trying to get somebody to like, dude, you gotta grow some of these, man. It's an easy one to do. Uh, but there's others just like that. So Ragosa Rose, so who lives in Everett? Who goes down to the waterfront in Everett? Okay, you know the roses and the median, the city plants, do you think they ever do anything to those except for drive a lawnmower over them to keep them down to the curb, right? That's Ragosa Rose. You know, I've got salt tolerance. If I sprayed a Ragosa Rose, I would nuke it. So we never spray a Ragosa Rose, period. We can't apply anything on there. Um, you can get mild soap if you get aphids on it, but you will have no black spot, no mildew, no disease, period. Ragosa Rose is immune to all that. And I found one I had left, and I get hips, rose hips, you know, right there in the winter. So that's got one little lonely one hanging on still. But that to me just adds more interest. Late summer, fall, winter, I've got some cool hips hanging on there, kind of for winter decoration. But I don't have to be is careful with Ragosa Rose at all. I can get tall ones, I can get short ones. They spread by root system, so it'll fill up an area. It's certainly not the you know choice for everybody, but if I'm looking for a, a barrier, they're pretty thorny. You know, I don't want the neighbor coming into my corner of my yard. Sweet, try to climb through that thing and get in here. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, I can put some nice Ragosa Roses out in the landscape, enjoy it, great fragrance, pretty flowers. They're not crazy Mr. Lincoln. I got a nice, simple, you know, single flower, and I get the cool hips on them as well. So, so Rosa Ragosa, Rosa Ragosa Alba would both be taller shrubs. When we had our place in Cleellum, 
these will grow anywhere. You know, I've been covered snow, buried by the elk, mound of the ground, didn't matter. Sweet, see you next year. Because they'll get six or eight feet, you know, if I let that grow and don't prune it. I can prune it to keep it low, but I, I let those get taller. If I look at the rest of these, this is what you're seeing down, I think, a lot of cities like Everett that want color, want something interesting for people that are driving by to see. But again, no spray, minimal water, don't really care about fertilizer, all the rest of it. This is the stuff they have down in those curb plantings. Plants like snow pavement, purple pavement, that are going to grow more like two or three feet tall and spread a little bit more to fill up areas like that. Okay. We've got a lot of hybrid rugosas like Hansa, Linda Campbell's a good red one. Did I put Therese, oh, I didn't put, my favorite one, we call her Teresa Bugnet around here, but it's really <laughs> Therese Bugnet, you know, you gotta think like French. So we always have Therese around here too. But all those again, I've eliminated the spray end of the maintenance. Yes, I'll feed it. Yes, I'll deadhead it. It's not that on those hybrids. And I've got pretty good heavy fragrance on all those, but I don't have to worry about the disease end as much, okay? So a couple ground covers. There's our Happy Trail series. We have Sunshine Happy Trails, Rainbow Happy Trails, Playful Happy Trails, Sunset Happy Trails. Man, I remembered all four. I'm not that old yet. So we got four colors. I think we're still waiting for one, but we have three of them in. And again, if, if I want color, no smell, Great color, don't have to deadhead them. Low growing, I could put those out on a sunny bank, you know, on a curb planting. Somewhere that's gonna look attractive all summer, fall into winter for the flower power, but I just don't have the maintenance again. Oh, there's the other two, I did guess right. Playful and Sunset. Drift roses, you know, again, I'm not planting these bare roots, so we'll have a few colors of these in. Uh, probably, I bet you they'll be here by 1st of April for sure, but probably mid-March-ish, I'm, I'm thinking right at this point. Um, we get a few colors. If you looked up Drift Roses online, you could probably pick out like 12 different shades now, from popcorn to apricot to lemon to scarlet to whatever. Um, we pick a few. If there's one that we can get for you, let us know. I'm happy to just order it in for you. we got a great grower of these uh, down in Oregon. I just ship up whatever we need, so uh, we can certainly do that. And then we've got flower carpet. You know, amber is the one color that's got a little bit of smell to it. So that's the only flower carpet rose that'll smell a little bit. These are all really vivid plants. And I intentionally, if you can see, hopefully with the screen on that landscape picture, that's what I'm talking about. When we talk about shrub roses, ground cover roses, flower carpet, all this extra stuff, I have a bed. I don't care about cutting flowers and bringing in vases. I wanna look out and see color. I wanna see color all summer long. That's a great landscape picture to kind of say, wow, there's a really nice bank of, of scarlet flower cup roses that bloom. I don't have to deadhead, throw some food on them <coughs> to keep them blooming. Maybe I watch a little bit of spraying on those, but I don't have the extra maintenance of all the deadheading as well. And then finally we get to the, the frankincense and myrrh, right? So David Austin's, um, you know, I try to get as many as we can, I think next year will be even better. Um, they're kind of getting caught up here after the pandemic. I hate to say it, but they sold out the sunny sides of the world for the general public for the last three years, and they sold all their roses to homeowners online, and they shipped them to you bare root for way too much money, if you want my opinion, bare root. But but that's how, you know, we're like, what do you mean you don't have any roses left? Oh, we sold them all to people online. It's like, gee, thanks. You know, <laughs> now, now we have none again. So this year we did get a pretty good chunk. I think next year, be back to normal where I can really hand select the exact ones I want to carry for our customers here but we do have some really good ones back there um, a few you can guess if he named it with the last name Austin that's his granddaughter that would probably be the best pink David Austin that he's ever traded a few years ago Olivia Rose Austin's his granddaughter uh, Darcy Bussell the poet's wife I like my yellow again so that's one of my favorites uh, Crown Princess Margareta will give you a little bit of rambling or climbing effect as well. Um, but you'll see a lot of things. The one thing, the one best thing, there's Windermere. Maybe you work for Windermere. You need to have a Windermere rose, right? Um, then Golden Celebration. The one good thing, you know, about all roses, and especially Austin, is that the tags are incredible. Look at that huge hang tag. It's got a picture for you. Everything you need to know. Uh, just written right on there. The fragrance rating, how big it'll get, where you can grow it, what you can do with it. I mean, they're really good uh, for information for homeowners on the pictures. And lastly, 
brand new for 2023. So these are the brand new roses if you're like me and you're half a plant snob and you always gotta have, well, I got the new one in my yard. Um, you know, this is the stuff that we tested out last year. We're happy with the results, so we, we, we stocked it in for our customers here for 2023. So we do have all these still in stock. We haven't sold out yet. They all do at some point here in spring. But uh, Heavenly Scented, you can probably guess that one's got some great smell. I was impressed with the smell on that one. I thought Morning Glow is looked totally different to me for a floor abundant. It was a different color and again a little bit different fragrance on the flower than the other yellows we've had. Picture Perfect is again totally different. The color scheme, that picture probably dulls out a little bit in the screen, but that again has got that really vivid color with that kind of undertone um, in the center again, just a little bit different. Uh, I had to get, I'm a I'm an 80s kid, so I had to get the Uptown Girl. That's Christy Brinkley, right? <laughs> so Christy Brinkley and Billy Joel gave us a rose here. Well, they didn't make it, but uh, but uh, Weeks did for them. So Uptown Girl is a big grand of flora, and that's, again, big, heavy fragrance on there. So that's another good pink one that's new. I thought these two are really interesting, um, and Star put out both of these. We, we have them both now. We were waiting for the for the top cream. Um, they look like Austin Roses again, part of that kind of new generation, but the fragrance was really interesting. That raspberry one smells like raspberries, and I'm not kidding you. I was like, are you kidding me? When it bloomed last year here, took a sniff and was like, all right, that can't be, and it is. So the breeders are able to kind of splice in some interesting smells on some, and that one to me was totally different. But uh, raspberry uh, cupcake and top cream, both excellent ones uh, that we have back there as well. And I put that one last because, A, I love the rose, love the flower, love the fragrance, love the disease resistance, and that is own root. So to me, if you were going to try another one there, like, ooh, I like that color, that is a, a, a winner to me. That was probably the best one I thought of the whole trials last year um, for all the reasons I just said. I thought it was one of the easiest ones to grow. It's a different color. It's got great smell. Um, and its own root, so I don't worry about, again, losing that in the winter no matter where I live. So, Sultry Night might be one to look for. We got a little chunk of those back there as well, okay? So, how do we do? Oh, uh, man, we only we had one hour and one minute. So, there's our um, our web address there, uh, the internet. Um, Nicole, our marketing director, and I spend a lot of time in the fall. The rose list is up there. All the pages are updated before we get to the new season. She has pictures of everything on there and really good descriptions we write up. So you can always find it online. But if you go back shopping in the sun today, of all days, every one of those roses got a huge billboard sign that'll tell you again everything we need to know and those hang tags. Don't lose those things. I, I don't know what you do. I got a little drawer in the garage. When I buy plants, I put the tags in there so I can always go back and find them later. Don't leave them hanging on the rose. You're going to lose it at some point. But um, it's not the old Jackson Perkins where you got that metal tourniquet hanging on there that was there for all eternity. We want to get those off too. But look at the sign, look at the tags. It's going to get you some great info. You're always welcome to email uh, the store with any questions, bring down samples. But please promise me you're not going to do nothing with your rose and then come say, Trevor, I need some help in July and ask me to fix what happened the entire season so far because that's the tough one. You gotta get ahead of this a little bit and then you'll have a much 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 easier time in the summer, okay?